Well, hey, folks, how goes it? Yes, you made it. We're all set. We've got a whole bunch of folks with us today. That is fantastic. I hope you had a great weekend. It's only Tuesday, so I'm still allowed to say I hope you had a great weekend if you're watching this on Tuesday. Rebecca, Colin, Jay, Sid, fantastic. Of course, we had Brittany and David and Jaden chime in. So, yeah, we're looking really good. We're looking really good. Hey, Tyler. So, this is what we're going to do today. Let's come on over here. Um, Gardner made it. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Good deal. Um. We're talking about business transactions today. Now, I want to remind you of something. This is not a history class, okay? It, it walks like a history class. It quacks like a history class. It feels like a history class. It is not a history class. Now, why does it feel like one? Well, because... We're exploring the foundations of business thought. Where have the practices that we follow today, where did they start? And it just so happened they started a long ass time ago. So, yeah, we're going to be starting talking about Samaritans and then we're going to be talking about Rome and Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. And you're going to be like, holy hell, this feels like a history class. It's not. I don't care about names. I don't care about dates. I don't care about any of that. What I care about is the foundation of business thought, where we get these ideas. So many times today, I am going to bring it back to today. We're going to be talking about Rome and commerce and so forth today. And you're going to be like, what, 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 what? Don't worry. I'm going to bring it back to today and I'm going to make this matter today. Okay. But just wanted to set that up. All right. So here's the thing when it comes to a business transaction. All right. Uh, <laughs> You know what a business transaction is. You've been doing them since you were born. You know what a business transaction is. However, as I like to say, you already know what we're going to talk about today. My job is to help you understand what you already know. Okay? So we're going to explore what a business transaction means and what that's all about. And I had this working earlier, so let's see if I can get it working now. I might just have to do the mouse thing because I have to go back and forth from OBS and the clicker, and I think the clicker just gets the mouse all confused. Um, we're going to be doing a couple of readings today, right? We're going to be talking about Short History of the World by H.G. Wells. Yeah! Uh, that H.G. Wells. He was actually into historical um, fiction and history and so on and so forth. Um, and then Greek and Roman Business by Ed Ng. So that's kind of what we're covering today. Now, there are a couple of videos on Canvas or on Nutshell Brainery, if you want to go straight to Nutshell Brainery, that cover some of the foundational basic elements of today's lecture. Uh, don't worry, if you have not yet watched these videos, you're going to still be just fine for the lecture. You're going to be fine. But the, the borrowing an egg defines a business transaction more, and we're going to be going into more depth on that today. And then you barter more than you buy. I really recommend the borrowing an egg is a good video. It's a good video. I made it. It's a good video. The barter more than you buy, I highly recommend you watch that because I maintain, and I think I support it in this video, that the lifestyle you enjoy today is not because of money. It's because of barter. And so take a look at that, but just a heads up there. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Um, and like I say, I'll bring it back to 
today, but we're going to start with our first reading, Short History of the World, H.G. Wells. Um, you know, it's really easy to look back and go, oh boy, ancient times, you know, they all just, you know, slept in caves and had rocks as pillows and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, whereas today we're so sophisticated, you know, today we, we're so educated, sophisticated, cultured, we really have it going on. Whereas back then, holy cow, yeah, it was awful, right? No, no. Um, We're going to be talking about Egypt. They built the pyramids, one of the seven wonders of the world, eight wonders of the world. I don't know how many wonders there are. I guess King Kong was the eighth wonder of the world. We're going to be talking about Babylon. That's where they had the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the world. It's been a long time since I walked through Draper and saw one of the seven wonders of the world, okay? My point is the sort of economy and commerce and business transactions that they were engaging in created such freaking wealth that they could go off and build these amazing things, right? And we're trying to figure out how to get potholes filled. So don't don't hate on the on the people because they look so basic. That's that's my invitation to you. Okay. So, here's where we're going to start. We're going to start in Samaria. So, and when you see quotes here, that's quotes from the reading. The settled folks had their textiles and their pottery and made many desirable things. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. We're going to be going back and forth for the next couple of slides. Settled. Settled people, meaning they're not moving from right here. All right, they've got a little town, a little village and whatever set up. They are settled. They are set. Okay, and they had textiles and pottery, and made lots of cool things. Okay, production. Whereas he also had these nomads, and the nomads would bring precious stones and things of metal and leather. They would bring stuff. Distribution. Okay, so This is where we're going to start getting some of these cool-ass points down here. Um, So, what, what allows the Sumerians to produce economic value? What are they doing to produce economic value because they are settled? Okay, so go ahead and start thinking about that. Uh, it's, it's in the text and it's in the pictures, right? But I want you to really think about what is it that they are able to provide the economy. So, for example, we have Jay saying agriculture and livestock. Yeah, agriculture and livestock, not all livestock, but for the most part, agriculture for sure requires you to say, stay the hell still, right? Um, even livestock, they can stay in the general area, right? You got to keep them pinned up. You might move them from area to area to get food and so forth, but you're certainly not nomads, right? So yes, Jay is right. Agriculture, livestock, they're able to produce these things. Um, Jay also said resources that benefit the community as a whole. Now, they are benefiting the community as a whole, to be sure. All right, let's see here. We also have Christina saying uh, artistry because they have time rather than traveling. Okay, they can really hone their skills, right? This pottery is pretty cool stuff because they can try different things and so forth. They can really hone their craft. I love it. Um, So now, now, Gardner, they don't provide trade routes. They do provide, and this is what I think you meant, access 
to trade routes, right? Because since they control the area, they can provide access to uh, water and food for the nomads and so forth, and they can provide waypoints for the nomads. I think that's where you were going. I agree. Um, Stability, uh, you can build the structures needed for industry and infrastructure. Okay, so now, yes. Um, we're talking past here, but that's all right. We'll get some, some mystery science theater in there. Here's the thing. They can build buildings, infrastructure, so they can build a kiln right? So they're making pottery. Pottery, by the way, is made by taking clay out of the ground, doing this crap with it, and then shoving it in a kiln. All of that requires you to be stationary. But because you're stationary, you can produce this stuff. Okay. So then what are the, um, what are the nomads? What what value to a to an economy do the nomads have? Because they're not stationary, so they're not building structures. They don't have an infrastructure in the same sense as our Sumerians. So what are the nomads providing? So think about that a little bit. You know, they're bringing precious stones and metal and leather from other areas and so forth. What are the nomads doing? So, Christina says, variety, more exotic items? Yes, okay? So, when you are stationary, nothing's exotic because it's all right here, okay? They can't get on an airplane, fly to Paris. All right, so exotic things need to be brought in. Okay, so precious stones, shells, things like this. All right. Uh, Brittany says, uh, are they helping uh, bring, you know, things from outside the current system? Absolutely. Um, mild sense of scarcity, making it rare, right? Yes. Okay. Now, what they also provide in this is a distribution system. So, here's the deal. They're bringing lots of stuff in. But hell, they're also going to be able to take stuff out. So, I'm making pottery, and for holy hell, I only need so many damn pots. And I've made all these pots and so forth. They have no value to me. A surplus pot have no value into me, to me, okay? However, if I take the surplus pot that has no value to me, and I give it to a nomad, and the nomad gives me something in return, some cool shells and stones and so forth, now all of a sudden that pot has value. Now, the nomad in some cases, doesn't want the pot. We'll come back to that. They can go off and sell that somewhere else, barter it, and so forth. I like the way Brittany puts this, insert new life into the economy. I like the way you put that. So, now, the, the nomads, of course, can, you know, go ahead and trade and so on and so forth, but they get a lot from the Sumerians as well, not just, okay, now we can trade. Check this out. A, a one, one thing that both the nomads and the Sumerians want is access to markets. Because if I'm a Sumerian and I have all these surplus pots, they're useless to me. They are valueless. But if I can trade them, they now have value. Therefore, I want more access to markets. Well, the nomads say, well, you know what? We want more access to markets as well. That's what we're all about. We're nomads. And so the Sumerians say, okay, that's cool. Because what we can do is we have textiles and we can do leatherworking and so forth. Um, we can make you special clothing that allows you to go to colder climates. And we can make these really cool pots and bags that form fit to your camels so that you can carry more water and go further or carry more goods and go further. And in return... 
you know, you're going to bring us these shells and we can grind up these shells and make them into glaze for our pottery and so forth, which increases the value and desirable aspects of our pottery. And so what you see here is actually a very sophisticated production and distribution system, one in which is ever increasing the value of everybody's work as they collaborate, okay? This is no different than today, no different, all right? We, we inject life, as Brittany, Brittany says, into uh, the economy by accessing markets, by cooperating, and, and all that good stuff, okay? So, if I come back over here, as I say, with precious metals and leather and station, uh, stationary people, the Sumerians can manufacture more products, which means increasing their manufacturing capacity and the variety of stuff they have. And with garments and bags and clay vases, nomads can carry more tr uh, trade goods and go further, therefore increasing access to markets. Pretty darn handy. Okay. As a result of all this, as it says here, we know that life for prosperous and influential people in such cities as Babylon and Egyptian Thebes um, was already almost as refined and as luxurious as that of comfortable and prosperous people today. Yeah, they had it all going on. We might see this sort of commerce as simple, but it creates wealth, which we're going to talk about later. It creates value. And as a result, folks are really successful. They're living some pretty awesome lives. They're doing well. Okay. But then what happens? Well, actually, let's, let's pause for a moment. Um, we'll get some more pointies. This may be ancient history, but the practice and results are not. Where do we see this today in our everyday communities? If you look around your community and so forth, who's out there taking something of relatively low value and converting it into something of higher value for somebody else? Jay, a yard sale is like a stupidly fantastic answer. That's great. That's when folks are, are taking something of relatively low value to them and making it, making it available to somebody else that has a high value. Resellers, right, if they're providing access to new markets. Um, truck drivers, yeah. Right? Truck drivers are... Yeah, no, we got our next one here. Plan 9 from outer space. Uh, real estate, yes, okay. Um, we've even got mining going on here with Kennecott and so forth. Um, there's really... I mean, everything around us is just like what we see here. Very good. Okay. But now, <laughs> there is a however, and this is a, we're going to read some history, but then we're going to bring it to the here and now very quickly. After the Roman annexation of Sicily, another process arose. Sicily was treated as a conquered prey. It was declared an estate of the Roman people. Its rich soil and industrious population was exploited to make Rome rich. Uh, the Patricians and the more influential among the plebeians secured the major share of that wealth. Okay. This is fancy speak for a bigger army came in and said, all this is ours. It's just the way it was. Ooh, did I say was? It's the way it is. Okay, so let's first understand what they're saying. You got these communities doing fan-freaking-tastic, wealth coming out of their ears, 
And the Roman Empire, which is bigger, using bigger army, army dis- diplomacy, says, ooh, I like all that wealth, and imagine what access that'll give us to bigger markets and, and all those productive people that we can use and exploit and so on and so forth. So they come in with their army and say, <laughs> you work for us. Now, I almost said a bad word. I say bad words all the time, but I don't want to say it too often. All right, we all know about that. Now, not thinking about armies and countries and so forth, where does this happen today? Step outside of armies and countries and think more about here is a small community creating wealth through value add activities in a larger community. Um, buying someone's business. That's where I'm going with it, right? Um, This is what uh, acquisitions is all about. A big company casts its eye about and says, damn, they're making bank. And you know what? They have some really cool patents. And they have access to these markets and trade agreements in place with these other, you know, areas or or customers that we don't currently have access to. And gosh, they have some smart people working for them. I'd sure love to have those people on board. And look at this new technology they just created. So they go in and acquire these companies. Um, Now, a few things about this. First of all, especially in the tech world, especially in the tech world, this is how companies grow. I understand that companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook, but Amazon, Google, let's just say, they've been around as long as you've been around. I get that. So they're part of your social construct. But they are new ass companies. They are really new companies. And the way they grew so quickly was acquisition, acquisition, acquisition. Okay. Um, And so in all of these acquisitions, they're not all voluntary, right? Um, Every once in a while, a a company will come along and say, hey, we want to acquire you. And the company says, nah, that's okay." And so the acquiring company says, we'll offer double your stock price. And so now all the stakeholders, all the shareholders, they're all like, oh, we got to sell. We got to sell because they just want to get rich. The company doesn't want to sell. They want to keep doing what they're doing. But the shareholders, they want to get rich. Or if the shareholders are like, no, we're not going to do it. The larger company might do what's called a hostile takeover. They might, you know, secretly buy shares here, 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 and here, and then find some large shareholders and pay them off and bring them on board on their side. And so now the company has to sell. This is really common. I mean, like daily. And that's what we're talking about here. By the way, Jay said, reminds me of real estate developers attempting to buy acres. Yes. Yeah, you know, they want to build these big uh, developments and so forth. And farmers are like, nah, we're cool. And the developers are like, that's funny. And made me sound, it made it sound like you think you have a choice. Trust me, I have more money. I have better paid lawyers. We're going to get this land. So remember, this is not a history class. This stuff happens all the time. Okay. Excellent. Let's come back over here. The war also brought in a large supply of slaves. Now, we're going to talk about slavery here for a moment. couple things about this. First of all, in ancient days, the wealth was because of slavery. It just was because of slavery. This is what created wealth. Um, among other things, right? But I'm just telling you, that was a major economic engine. The next thing I'm going to say is it's not as gone as you might think it is. 
All right. It is uh, uh, heinously depressing how much slavery and child labor is still practiced in this world today. And we just don't really know about it because we don't see it. It's not immediate. If you're in my international business class, David, David was in my international business class. He knows what I'm talking about because, yeah, it's, yeah, Brittany, it still exists. And uh, it's heinous. I want to acknowledge this, all right? But now I want to bring it into real, not real world because it's in the real world, but I want to make it more relevant to us. So bear with me. The world, uh, the war also brought in a large supply of slaves. Before the first Punic War, the population of the Republic had been largely population of citizen farmers. So we're all farmers. We're all farmers. Ah, we farm. Yay, we farm. Okay. So we're all farmers. And by the way, up until recently, uh, the vast majority of people on earth practiced farming because we didn't have the technology and the automation that we do today. Anyway, so we're all farmers. Military service was their privilege and their liability, which meant every once in a while, the Caesar or the Senate would say, yeah, we're going to war. And so all us farmers had to leave our farms and go off to war. All right. While they were on active service, their farms fell into debt and a new large-scale slavery agriculture grew up. When they returned, they found their produce in competition with slave-grown produce from Sicily and from the new estates at home. So this is what's happening. You and I are farmers. We're farmers. Hey, 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 that rocks. But we have to go to war. All right. Oh, we, oh. so we go off to war, right? Over the hill, over, over hill, over dale, all that sort of stuff. And then we come back a year later and our farms are, if you own a yard or if your parents own a yard, you know that if you don't tend your art yard for a month, let alone a year, that yard is gone. So we come back and we notice our our farms are all gone to fallow and we're in horrible debt because we still have to pay our bills even though we're off at war and all that stuff. Meanwhile, over in other areas of the empire, they're using slave labor. And so all that food and produce is coming into the market at the lowest possible prices you can imagine because it's slave produced, while we are looking at a farm that can't produce anything because we've been away too long and we're in debt. You see what I'm saying? Now, this is going to be really relevant here in a moment. By the way, um, yeah, human trafficking as well, Brittany. It really is. It really is. If, uh, if we were in a different class, we'd be going deep on that one, but it's, it's a real deal. Okay, so this is happening, all right? So then, times had changed. The Republic had altered its character. Not only was Sicily in the hand of Rome, uh, the common man was in the hands of rich creditor and the rich competitor. The common citizen of Roman Empire was therefore in a very poor case. He was impoverished. He had lost his farm. He was ousted from profitable production by slaves, and he had no political power to him to remedy such things. All right. So, so now what's happening, and this is going to be relevant here in a moment, so stick with me. You've got people wandering around who are either free or recently freed, right? Maybe they bought their freedom or so on and so forth. But you got this poor, impoverished class. We no longer have our farms. We are in debt. We're free, but we have to go out there and find work now. But the thing is, all we know is farming. And to find work, we have to compete with slaves. Now, here's my first question. How do you compete with slave labor? If I'm an employer and two people come to me, one says, I'm a slave, I work for nothing, you just feed me. 
And another one says, I want $15 an hour. Hmm, which one am I going to hire? So that's my first question. How do you compete with a slave labor labor class? This is not an abstract question we're going to see in a moment. Okay, so first thing you could do is you could lower pay. You know what? We could, but I don't want to lower my pay, right? I, I, I still want to be paid okay. Uh, so we could do that, but then it becomes what we call a race to the bottom. In other words, who's going to work for the least? And since slaves work for zero, the bottom is pretty darn low. But this is what a lot of companies do. So lower pay. How am I going to compete, guys? How are you going to compete if we have slave labor out there? So think about that. This is, this is highly relevant. Don't worry, you'll see on the next slide. Um, Jay says, offer slightly better benefits such as food. Okay. Now, what I'm, what I'm saying, Jay, is us as employees. I think you guys are thinking as employers, which is actually pretty darn cool because you are the future employers of this, of this nation. I'm talking about us as employees. How am I going to compete to get a job when the other pe person competing to get that job works as a slave? That's what I'm asking. How am I going to get a job when others are out there working for more or less free? How am I going to do that? Now, as you think about this, I'm going to tell you why this matters to you. Um, as in the wrong slide, um, uh, have better skills than everyone else. I really like that. Um, negotiate your position depending on what skills you have. I agree. And this is why it matters. Now, I'm going to say for a moment that I get that I'm an old man. And old men are prone to standing out on the yard and shaking their fist at clouds and saying, oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's awful. It's horrible. And so on and so forth. I get that. I get that. Nevertheless, I am going to say artificial intelligence poses an existential threat to your employability. And I really, really mean that. Okay. Um, artificial intelligence, it, up until now, it's always been automation. Automation is more or less free labor. Okay. So companies automate and automate and automate and pushes out jobs and so forth. But we've always been able to adapt. The human species, our, our ability to earn a living is pretty extraordinary. Um, but artificial intelligence is a different, is a different beast. Um, I am genuinely concerned about the future of your generation and your ability to get work. Let me show you some things. Um, first of all, up until recently, we had a writer strike. The writer strike has since been resolved, um, but um, it's going to come up again in four years. These contracts for the writers last every four years. One of the sticking points for the writers was they were saying, hey, dear studios, we don't want you using AI to write these stories and so forth. And the studios were like, why would we walk away from such a cool technology as, as artificial intelligence? Okay, let me be clear about this. The stories that AI can write today are bad. 
But there's a lot of content out there being produced that is bad. Okay. However, a year from now, let alone four years from now, AI will be able to write a killer, kick ass original story in 10 minutes. And all it will take is a small group of editors to go through these stories generated for free and in infinite quantity, go through these stories, edit them, tweak them, and so on and so forth, and then send them off to production. We won't need writers anymore. This is a problem. Um, Brittany, my realm of experience AI has been uh, working in art, right? Yes, the archive fan fiction was uh, scraped by AI bots. Yes, yes, the art. Okay, so this, there's a lawsuit going on right now from a whole bunch of big, huge mega authors. Same sort of lawsuit is going on with, with, with artists. Brittany, but I'm more familiar with the one by authors, so I will speak to that one. But it's the same sort of lawsuit. The authors, including uh, Martin, who wrote Game of Thrones, and Stephen King, a whole bunch of real authors, right? They're suing, saying, listen, your large language models, and I'm not going to go into detail about how AI works and so on and so forth, but your large language models scraped through our work to create these new works. And you did not compensate me. You did not ask permission. And this is copywritten work. Um, and the artists are going through the same thing, so on and so forth. Now, this is a high, not even a hypothetical. I make these videos and <laughs> check it out. Doing one right now. I make videos and I pay a company to do closed captions for these videos. Well, up until very recently, it cost me a dollar fifty per minute to close caption a video. So if I have a 20 minute video, 20 times a dollar 50, what, 30 bucks? That's 30 bucks. Cost me 30 bucks to close caption a video. Or I could have it done by AI at 25 cents per minute. And by the way, it, it's much faster. And they say 90% plus accurate. It's now, and I have tested it, it is now as accurate as a human translation for a video that I know my transcript for and everything like that. So um, right away, if your living was in translation, your living is gone. Gone. Okay. Um, Brittany, yeah, published authors have, a, you know, have a leg to stand on. Yeah. Fan fiction writers. Yeah. yeah a little bit, a little bit different in their world. Right. Um and I'm a fan of fan fiction. Gosh, can I write fan fiction based on a fan fiction work? That'd be so cool. Anyway, back to back to your job, Lon. So here's what I'm what I'm telling you. Um, there's going to be three kinds of jobs in the future, okay? And I really, 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 please. For the sake of your future and our future economy, think about this for a moment. There are going to be jobs that are completely replaced by AI. I mean completely replaced. Don't go into these industries. We will, in fact, be answering the question of what industries should you look at and should you not in a future lecture. So we won't go into it now, but we will talk about this in detail. There are jobs that will be completely replaced by, by AI, okay? Um, we'll talk accounting, Brittany. Same bat time, same bat channel, we'll talk. Then there are jobs that AI will never touch. And I mean never, ever touch, at least in our lifetimes, okay? So you really want to look at those jobs. The majority of jobs, though, folks, 
are jobs that will continue to exist, but you need to know how to use and leverage AI to do these jobs well. And people who learn how to use AI are going to thrive in those roles. People who do not learn how to use AI in these jobs will be rousted out, okay? These are the majority of the jobs. This is why I encourage you to use AI and yes, for assignments as well. If you go to the welcome packet that I sent out to you, um, I have a link to a live stream that I did about how to use AI in school ethically. And I have like 17 things you can do. So there are many, 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 many ways that you can learn to use AI in your schoolwork ethically without cheating or anything like that, and will make you a better student and a better employee. So you really want to do that. Okay, that's enough of my soapbox for the moment. Isn't there a way to use AI? Yes. Yes, Gabby, we can totally use AI to our advantage. This is what I'm encouraging you to do. And I use AI all the time. And it's great. Um, complains lightly and playfully. I don't want to use. No. <laughs> no for. OK, but let's do it. We got stuff to go over. We've got a class. But let me just tell you for your writing assignments. OK. At the very least, you can use AI as an uber spell checker and grammar checker, right? So what I do is I take a paragraph that I have written, shove it into AI, and I tell it, check the following for spelling and grammar. If there are no problems, no errors, make no changes. And it pumps back and says, well, then in that case, it's fine. Or it'll say you misspelled this word, right? There are, there are many, many, many ways. So, Brittany, please go to my, um, uh, my live stream on how to use AI. You'll see a ton that writers can use. Okay. All right. Let's, let's keep going. But, oh, my gosh, I'm like totally in love with all of this uh, dialogue. All right. Um. Okay, we have been going now for 45 minutes. Let's do a break. Let's do a juggling break. I'm going to come on over here. In there, yeah. Um, this is just to get up and stretch. I mean, it, it, guys, you can't, these live streams, these are, these are trying. I get it. I really, they're trying. So just get up and stretch and move for a moment. Um, David says, old man moment. I don't even know um, how to use AI <laughs> faint angle thing. You will. Okay. As I said in our previous live stream, during our live stream breaks, I'm going to teach you how to juggle. You don't need to learn how to juggle if you don't want to. Just stand up, stretch, get a drink, do whatever. But the, for those of you who are interested in learning to juggle, I hope you got yourself a bean bag or something. Today, we're just going to use one. Just one. Just one. That's it. Um... And what we're going to do is learn to toss the ball. Just toss the ball. Now, you might think, oh, for the love of all that's holy, Lon, I know how to toss a ball. You bear with me, okay? First of all, in terms of height, you want it to be maybe just a little bit above eye level. There'll be a time that you'll do it at eye level, okay? But just eye level or a smidge above, okay? That's the first thing. The next thing is, of course, you want to go back and forth. You want this toss and catch to be both left and right. You want both hands to practice this toss and catch. All right. Next, you'll notice that as I do this, my hands are not moving much. In especially my catching hand, all right? Well, except in that case. 
when we toss the ball, we want to learn how to toss the ball such that our catching hand, I don't need to look to catch the ball, right? So if I throw it on down here, just so I'm staring at you, I'm staring at the camera. I'm not looking at the ball. It's because I know generally where it is. And if my catching hand is generally in the right area, then we're fine. So we're not chasing it. Furthermore, when we're throwing the ball, we're not doing great, big, huge motions. We're just giving it enough of a bump that it goes because that hand is about to catch a ball, right? So you want to keep your hands actually pretty darn stationary. When we look at somebody actually juggling, those hands are more or less in the same place all the time because they, even though I throw a ball, it's about to become a catching hand. So we want our hands to stay in more or less the same area, okay? I'm telling you, this fundamental throw is important. So if you're learning to juggle with me, get, you know, get comfortable doing this fundamental throw. And that's all we're doing today. That's one ball. Next week, we'll do two. All right? Okay. Then let's, uh, let's come on back for a moment. Uh, yeah, coffee break, right? Um, all right, here's what we want to do. And I'm going to go ahead and throw in another couple of these. You guys have been doing fantastic. Does that get us up? Oh, yeah, we're getting pretty darn close there. You're going you're gonna to get the full points today. Okay, so let's come on back here. Wealth. What is wealth? So I want you to really, and, and not just for this assignment, assignment, for this discussion right now to get these little cool points down here, Old man advice for a moment. Really take the time, and it'll take months, to fully understand what does wealth mean to you. Because I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now, wealth is not the same thing to everybody. Everybody has a different idea of what is wealth to them. But in order to live a happy, fulfilled, thriving life, you need to know what does happy, fulfilled, and thriving mean to you. In other words, what is wealth? So let's play with this for a moment. I got Jay saying depends. Uh, yeah, you know, subjective beliefs. Yeah, but Jay, I'm asking what's your subjective belief? What's, what's wealth mean to you? Let's play with this for a moment. We're going we're gonna to fill this out down here. What's wealth to you? Let's see some ideas. And by the way, you can't be wrong. <laughs> Isn't this class awesome? You can't be wrong. They're all good answers. Okay, so money. All right, now here's what I'm going to say about, about money, right? I maintain that money is not wealth. It is what money provides. So, what does money provide that makes it wealth for you? Now, David said comfort. Yes, I would agree with that. Someone with, uh, you know, good darn salary or lucky lottery, right? But again, that gives, gives you money. What is it that money is giving you that makes it wealth? Because if you had a stack of money right now, at this very moment, you would have more money, but you would not have a better life. How are you going to use that money to get the better life? Okay, Gabby says freedom, all right? Um, if freedom is just one word, so I am going to read some things into this one word. For me, freedom, 
is financial freedom. I don't have to work a job I don't want to work. Autonomy, um, free time for me uh, that way, freedom from creditors and so forth. This is what freedom means for me. It can mean anything to anybody, but Gabby, when I see that, that's what I see. Uh, Jocelyn, being able to live a comfortable life. And I agree. I agree. You can't be wrong, remember? What does comfortable mean to you? Um, I I am comfortable in my home. I'm very comfortable in this home. Somebody else could be comfortable in less of a home. And I know people in my neighborhood who have sold and moved to bigger homes because they weren't comfortable in their small home in my neighborhood. I'm like, "Uh, you scum. But you know, okay, so what does comfort mean to you? Um, Purchase power. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I want it. I'm going to get it. That's a pretty, pretty heady stuff. I really agree with purchase power. Um, For my 20th wedding anniversary, which was 15, 16 years ago or whatever, my wife and I went to Europe. It's the first and only time that we've ever traveled like that because we said, all right, we've got to do this. And I saved a whole bunch of money and so on and so forth. And when we were traveling, anything we wanted, we did or bought. And it's the one and only time in our lives that we were able to experience that. And it was like being drunk. I've never been drunk, but I I can imagine. Um, Monetary value, thinking long term, it would be freedom and ability to travel. I like that a lot. Um, Education, oh, stupendous, right? Um, Well, for me, it would be a peaceful life on a plot of land that is self-sustaining and where I don't have to work long hours to maintain the ease of life. Um, By the way, and and this is just me playing with you, and is this the button? Where's the button? No, I can't find the button. I have a cool button that does button things. Oh, well, we'll just do that because you guys got the, the full points there. I need to fix my other button. Okay. There's no such thing as self-sustaining land with no work, (laughs) just so you know. But I feel you. I feel you. I totally get it. Um, Wealth for me would like, okay, let's see, financial knowledge. Oh, gosh, Gabby. I wish I had studied personal finance much earlier in my life. Um, I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes because I did not have financial insights and knowledge and so forth. Don't want to be the first thought in my mind when I say, can I afford this 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 month? Yeah. Oh, Brittany, I get it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Brittany, you get what I'm saying. 40 to 60 hours a week to be self-sustaining. Right? Actually, we're going to talk. Okay, oh, I get have you noticed I like my job? We're going to talk about this like in a week or two, how division of labor and the community actually enables us to live better. Although I get the idea of self-sustaining. Okay. Yeah, Colin, I got confetti. Sure. Right. Okay. So here's the thing. As Jay said at the very beginning, wealth is subjective. All right. Um, But wealth is also, and this one didn't come up here, and that's not a problem. I asked what wealth was for you. I didn't say what it was for a nation or anything like that. Wealth is also the economic environment in which you live, public wealth. This is what I mean. Um. And I think I did this diatribe with you earlier, but I'm going to do it again because it's I'm the professor. I get to do what I want, which is actually wealth for me, just so you know. Um, You live a pretty sweet – the average age of everyone here is 22, and you live a pretty sweet life. Now, I say that, but I also want to recognize that I do not know you. I do not know your life. And you have definite trials that you go through. And you've gone through trials and you've gone through traumas. And it doesn't always feel like a sweet life. I understand that. I get it. 
However, allow me this moment to say, in general, for the most part, you don't wonder, where am I going to sleep tonight? Where am I going to get my next meal? Um, you, you have safety and security in your life. You also have computers and internet connectivity, you spoiled brats. And, and you have streaming services. And you have these cool-ass things, right? Um, you live a pretty wealthy life. You have transportation, you have access to nice roads. All of this wealth is because of public wealth. And one of the things the reading talks about, oh, that's why it did that before. No, 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 I want to do that, and then I want to do that. Um, a lot of this public wealth is what the Greeks and Romans were really into, okay, is creating a society, an economy that allowed everybody to live a pretty darn sweet base level of wealth, okay? Um, once again, I do not want to be cavalier when I say this um, because I understand different situations and I've been in different situations. However, I was in India once and somebody said, I want to be poor in the United States where even poor people are fat and have cell phones. And I, that kind of blew my mind because I am going to submit to you that you've, you have no idea what poverty is until you go to India or some of these other places where poverty is... Yeah. What the Romans and Greeks and so forth were interested in is setting a baseline that everybody could enjoy a certain degree of wealth just because they lived there, right? So in the case of the United States, we have libraries. By the way, libraries are also online and you can get connectivity there. There's a lot you can do at libraries, museums, endowments for the arts, national parks, K through 12 education paid for through uh, the state, through property taxes, parades, celebrations, national archives, power, water, and transportation infrastructures. Don't diss power, water, and transportation infrastructures. These are the backbones upon which wealth is created. Um, so just something to bear in mind in terms of the reading and the questions and the tests and all that sort of stuff. Brittany, as a 35-year-old millennial, I would like to counter that just because uh, even the homeless people can have a cell phone, it doesn't mean uh, there's wealth. Wealth can be a veneer, an illusion. I agree. I agree. Um, so, again, I do not want to be count, uh, cavalier about this. Um, and, for example, every, every year here in Salt Lake um, or in Salt Lake City, they hold a vigil in the winter for the people, the homeless, who passed away in the city during the winter because they froze to death. And it's always six, seven, eight. And so this is real. I, I, I do not want to understate the reality of, of, of poverty here in our region. That's different than India, though, where they actually have death wagons that move through the places and pick people up each day, right? So it's, it, I do contend it's different, but I do not want to understate the, um, the anguish and trials that the homeless go through here. Um, my mother always told me to travel internationally, and it'll be uh, humble your perception, come back home. Yes, many places. Um, yeah, yeah, totally, totally true, totally true. Um, I, so just real quick, I, um, I've lived in five countries. Um, I grew up in primarily the U.S., but I also grew up in England and France, and I spent some time in Japan and then a little bit of time in Malaysia. Um, 
every country, I speak three languages, so I've been around the block. And while America is by no means perfect, and we have some serious issues, and we've got to solve them, and we need to work together to solve them, so let's not break ourselves into ideological tribes and start throwing stones and spears. we got to solve our problems. But I really like it here. I've lived in many places. I really like it here. Okay. Um, always been told that we're blessed because we don't have to grow our own food. Uh, someone has health problems. And we have regulatory bodies that make sure that our food is healthy. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Discount other countries and their poverty levels for sure. Yes. I t yes. This is not to do that. Um I feel financially down sometimes, on the other hand. I feel um, good in the... Okay, so Colin, this is a good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Here's, here's one of the things that we need to appreciate is that your baseline is what you grew up with and what's around you. Therefore, when you compare yourself to your baseline of what you grew up and with what's around you, you can think, I am behind, therefore I need to go to school, I need to get an education, I need to get marketable skills, I need to start a business, I need to get a, a good career going, because you're comparing yourself with your baseline and those around you. And so, yeah, you can get down. We're not comparing ourselves with others who we don't see and so forth. So once in a while, we should travel internationally and realize that we have a pretty darn good. Um, yeah, yeah, Tyler, uh, even better than traveling and living in one of these countries, I get new views on everything. Uh, I lived in Philippines and traveled around Asia. Yes, yes. Um, and then Gardner, you, you, you see what we're talking about there. Totally, right? Um, okay, happiest people. All right. We need to stay on topic. Happiness is not correlated with money. If you want to talk about the... Now, don't get me wrong. Money rocks. I mean, money is a da bomb, okay? So, I'm not trying to be cavalier about money, but it's not correlated with, with happiness. We need to talk about that later on. But in the meantime, we need to do what I'm paid to do so I can get money. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Okay, here's what we're going to... Okay, we started at, uh, at 8.30. We've got 9.30. Good. All right, we're almost there. The last thing we want to talk about here is Gibbon and the fall of Rome. So Rome's out there kicking ass, taking names. But as you know, Rome fell, right? Okay. There's only about 18,000 theories about how Rome fell. Gibbon, in the book Decline of the Roman Empire, I have a copy. I have not read it. Um, he has four theories, all right, or four contributing factors. Many other historians disagree with Gibbon. So... That means that we are about to go over some theories that uh, on the you know what what brought down the Roman Empire that a lot of other historians disagree with. So why are we going to go over them? Because it's not a history class. I don't care. I don't care. What I do want to do is connect Gibbon's ideas with what you and I go through today. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that today so far. You guys have rocked. You know, we haven't get, gotten all hung up in the history. We're talking about what this means to us. And that's what we want to do. Okay, so let's look through these. First of all, Gibbon says, first is the burden placed on everyone through commandments. By the way, by the way, his root issue Gibbon's root issue is Christianity. This guy had it in for Christianity, okay? Now, I don't, I don't care if you're pro, anti, indifferent, doesn't matter. 
what we're talking about is how it affects us today, and it's not Christianity, it's the principles that we're looking at. So just, I'll show you what we mean. Okay, first is the burden, uh, let's come back here, uh, placed on everyone through commandments to avoid certain motives in their daily life. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thou nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, or his ass, or anything, blah, blah, blah. Humanity should be content with what it has. Any distraction from a pious life was now considered a temptation and to be avoided. So in other words, what Gibbon is saying here is, listen, Rome got rich because it coveted. <laughs> oh, yeah. Rome coveted the hell out of the world, right? So it went off and conquered it. Um, and Christianity comes along and says, that's not cool, man. That's not cool. You should not always be acquiring wealth, okay? That's a vice, not a virtue. Old Rome said acquiring wealth is awesome. And New Rome said, ooh, acquiring ro wealth, not cool, all right? Well, here's the thing. Now we're going to bring it to modern. There's a really good movie out there called Wall Street. It's an old movie by your standards, okay? Um, Charlie Sheen and Michael Douglas, I think it is. And then, oh, what's her name from Splash? Anyway, good movie. And in this movie... Um, Michael Douglas, I think it is, plays this character called named Gordon Gecko, and Gecko is the antagonist. He's the bad guy. All right, he's the bad guy, and he owns this um, basically a uh, a um, oh I forget what they're called venture capital firm, not even venture capital. Anyway, he buys up companies and basically tries to get them, buys up struggling companies and tries to get them going again and profitable, or he takes them apart and sells off the assets, right? And companies hate him because he's always buying up companies and, and destroying them. Well, he's, he does this speech in front of all of these executives and shareholders for this company that he's trying to acquire. And he has this, this amazing speech. He says, Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all its forms, greed for life, greed for, for money, for love, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. I really like that because it can be argued all day long, either way. I really like the way he says greed for lack of a better word, because greed has, and we're going to talk about this in future lectures, greed is made into a dirty word for a variety of reasons. And yet, greed is a driver. When I asked you guys what's wealth mean to you, and you put out your wish list, that was a greedy wish list. And that's totally cool, because that's what brings you to class. That is what keeps you working and moving forward. Um, personal view, Tyler, I agree. I agree. And that's why Gordon Gecko's like greed, for lack of a better word. Okay, the other thing, number two of four, that uh, Gibbon says is, second, traditionally Roman shame meant failing the people. Romans had no concept of sin until the, they changed to Christianity. When oaths were taken by ancient Romans, they were oaths to sustain the empire or the senate and the people of Rome. Everything changed when new oaths had to be taken in the name of the cross. 
Instead of civil law, sacred law, divine law became the basis of all contracts and business and relations. So the root issue that Gibbon's talking about here is devotion to yourself or something other than the good of the whole community was a problem. Well, um, oh, greed get you on the varsity call. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, always greed who would get on the varsity. What a great example. That's good. Okay, well, let's look at this. And I'm going to kind of get here and get out and make this a little easier to read. I love this cartoon from The New Yorker. This is one of the best cartoons I've ever seen. You know, all these kids out on a desolate earth where, you know, everything's been destroyed. You see some dilapidated buildings in the background somewhat. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for our shareholders. Um, you know what? This is not ridiculous. Quote from Milton Friedman, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, um, economist. There is one and only one resp social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engages in open and free competition without deceit or fraud. So what's my connection? My connection is, in business, is our devotion to what good we could possibly do for the community, for our families, for ourselves, and so on and so forth? Or is our devotion to creating profit for shareholders? According to Milton Friedman, creating profit for our shareholders is our one and only responsibility. Others will say, no, we have a social responsibility. We have a responsibility to our communities, to the environment, to the planet, so on and so forth. This is what Gibbon is kind of talking about, is this push and pull between your allegiance. That's my assertion. Anyway, um, Brittany, greed in definition is an intense selfish desire. Greed is definitely a force pulling people but that force without thought or the impact of your actions can cause greater harm to others. I like that. It's not the greed itself that's problem. It's the actions rooted in greed that do not consider the larger environment. That's interesting. I like that. Greed without restrictions creates a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then who sets those restrictions? Remember, you wanted freedom. That was wealth for you. Who sets the restrictions? I don't invite anyone to set restrictions for me, and I don't think you do either. Okay, third. We're almost there, folks. Bear with me. Third, another co um, commandment such as thou shalt not kill placed a new burden on civilization, which, which must defend itself with citizen soldiers. Who will take up defense of the state if killing is forbidden? Now that every Roman was required to accept Christianity, the prohibition on killing became an excuse to avoid military service, right? So unwillingness to defend your country and so forth. Um, so quick story. Um my story right here. When I was 16 years old, the son of pacifist hippies living in the Bay Area, um, when this was decided, when Reagan started the draft again, for two years that followed, my friends and I debated what we would do when we turned 18. Some of us registered and some of us did not. So just to clarify again, I'm 16 years old. Then President Reagan reinstitutes the draft as kind of a scare tactic on the Russians, on the USSR for back then. And, uh, and so when you turn 18, you have to register for the draft. And we talked a lot about that, me and my friends. Like I said, I, I grew up with with pacifist uh, parents, and all my friends were in the Bay Area. Most of us were. Some of us registered. Some of us didn't. That became a, a, an issue, right? So this is kind of what Gibbon's talking about. Um, 
Colin, you weren't able to play on the varsity during the spring season, the main one, except I did get in some summer, though it was greed or playing favorite, um, you know, with favorites, parents, kids. Yes, yes, there are favorites. Yes. Oh, my gosh, it's so true. Okay, last one. Fourth, the creation of a monopoly is always disastrous to free trade. This is true whether the monopoly is for a commodity such as grain from merchants or sacred services provided by religion. Ancient Rome and Greece were religious, but they never, you know, they had never been anything monopolistic about sacred things. They had many civic gods, and there were no record of any wars between states fought over religious ideas among Greeks or Romans until the conversion to this new monotheism. So, what's the root issue? Insisting that there's only one right way rather than acknowledging that there might be nuances and many options and so forth. Where do we see this today? We see it in politics and ideologies, right? Somehow or another, many of us have bought into this idea that there are only two solutions, and you're either with us or you're against us. And, and, and we are going to just beat the living bejesus out of each other until there's only one person standing in the ring, okay? Um, and enjoy the next 11 months, everyone, because that's what we're going to be seeing. Whereas recognizing that everybody's in the middle— <laughs> And we're all centrist, and we're all in the middle, and, and, and actually we agree on a hell of a lot more things that we disagree on. That's not what you're encouraged to think about. You're encouraged to focus on the differences and encouraged to vilify those who think differently than you do. And this is on uh, both sides, okay? So that's the main root issue that Gibbon was talking about there. All right. You did it. Oh, my holy hell. Good for you. Uh, we went, gosh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, it's only uh, an hour and 20. That's all right. But your contributions were epic. Thank you. Really, thank you. Now, I encourage you once again to watch those two videos that I referenced there at the beginning, the two videos that are in Canvas. And, um, and when it comes to the readings, we went over everything that you really need to care about in the readings. So if at any stage you're like, what do I need to look at and so forth, pull up this video and just click through to the place where you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to answer or what have you, and then you can find that in the reading itself. Um, but you're in good shape. But if you've watched those two videos, then with what we went over today, you're golden going forward, okay? Yeah, Brittany, you crushed it. You crushed it. Um, as per usual, please drop me an email and just say, here. That's all you need to do. That way I know, because, you know, I know we got Colin and Brittany and Tyler and so on and so forth, but then we have like T. King. I don't know who T. King is. Hey, T. King. Somewhere out there. But that way I just know who is here and I'll go ahead and get you these uh, sweet, sweet extra credit points. And then as always, I'm going to hang out here a little bit and yeah, right, there's T King, right? All right, we've got the Yankees fan there. Um, I'm gonna hang out here. So if you have any questions or anything you wanna discuss, we can go over that. If you would like me to set up a Zoom meeting so that we can talk uh, individually, I can do that as well. But otherwise, you're all set. Have a fantastic rest of your week. Get on to the, if you haven't done the assignment for this week, which was last module from last week, 
So last week's lecture is due this week. Get on to that. And heck, if you've already done it, then do next week's assignment today because we've gone over everything. All right? So yeah, have a good one. Gardner and Tyler and Jocelyn, Rebecca, thank you. I truly appreciate it. Your, your contributions today have been great. Aline, thank you. Yes, good to see you here too. Yes, we're almost done, puppy. Puppy wants to say hi again. Oh, yeah, puppy wants to say hi again. Say hi. There they are right there. Yeah, they're right there. Yeah, okay. Oh, we'll see you, David and Brittany and Jaden and Colin. Well, oh, Jay, I need to, what's the, re, um, Donata. There we go. I'm just trying to remember the response to Gracias. Christina, we'll see you later. Grace, you bet. Um, <laughs> a great Dane, Tyler. Wow. That's a big one, right? Eldon, we'll see you later. Normal sized, a great Dane. I don't know that I believe that. <laughs> oh, so normal size for a great Dane. All right, all right, I can buy that. We have a couple of Frenchies as well, and one of them's a little small, and the other one's a real brute. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any uh, new questions or anything. So uh, I think we will go ahead and wrap things up. Have a, uh, there we go. Have a great week and we'll see you next week.